it wouldn't be unfair to say that um, Saki East is really the unsung hero of sake brewing. Um, you know, much like um, grapes with um, with wine production. Hey everyone, welcome to the episode 19 of Sugidama podcast, the podcast about Japanese sake, the drink which, like many alcoholic beverages, is made by fermentation, using one of the key fermenting culture known to the humanity, yeast. And we are going to talk about it with a person who uses it for exactly this purpose, a sake brewer and author of Origin Sake blog, Andrew Russell. But before I introduce our guest, let me tell you about our sponsor, London Sakia, who have one of the widest selection of premium and craft sakia available online today. You can choose from over 100 sakia from 25 breweries and they will deliver across the UK and many European markets. And if you don't know what sakia to choose, you can use simple online tasting notes together with very sensible and affordable food pairings to help you decide. What's more, you can get a 10% discount by just using the code SUGIDAMA, all caps, during checkout. London Sakia, making Sakia simple. My name is Alex, and I live in London. I'm a certified Sakia specialist, Sakia judge, and Sakia educator and advocate. Besides this podcast, I have SUGIDAMA blog, where I write about Sakia, published tasting notes and overviews and information about sake events happening in London. So today we are going to conclude the sake ingredients mini-series and talk about sake yeast, which Andrew called an unsung hero of sake brewing. Andrew moved to Japan from Scotland a few years ago to pursue his interest in what he described as a fascinating and multifaceted country and fulfill his dream of becoming a sake brewer. He started working as a kurabita, a sake brewery worker, first at a small brewery on the outskirts of Okayama Prefecture, and then at iconic Imada Shuzo, a sake brewery located in Hiroshima Prefecture. Imada Shuzo is famous not only for its amazing sake, Imada Fukucho, but also for its toji, master brewer, Miho Yamada, who has been recently named one of the 100 most influential women by BBC. Anyway, as I said, Andrew is a sake brewer and he deals with yeast and other aspects of sake brewing every day. He also is a very nice and interesting guy with amazing sense of humor and vast knowledge of everything sake. I enjoyed talking to him so much and learned a lot about sake yeast. So here we go. Please welcome our guest. Hello, uh, Andrew. How are you? Hi, Alex. I'm, I'm good. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, very nice um, to see you. Um, and um, we haven't met, but uh, it's the first time we talk, but we interacted quite a lot on the internet. So it's, it's pretty cool. And thanks a lot for agreeing to talk about this uh, amazing subject as um, Psyche Yeast. My, my pleasure. Okay, um, so why don't we start with um, you telling uh, our listeners a bit about yourself and how you ended up in um, uh, Imada Shoes? Um, so a, a long story short, I, I, I had a 12-year career in the UK um, that just felt like it was it was kind of time to do something different, and uh, that that um, happened. At the same time, that was developing an interest in Japan, um, and I ended up coming out here first, um, just on a working holiday visa. Um, didn't really pay much of an interest in sake, um, but then from that working holiday, um, I, I decided that I wanted to um, to come back somehow, um, and I ended up doing. Uh, I actually did my bachelor's degree in uh, in Japanese studies, um, which took me back to Japan. Um, and that was the time that, um, you know, it wasn't a sort of, you know, one single moment that 
um, you know, this eureka moment that people talk about. But um, that was when, you know, the, the, the fire was lit um, for my interest in sake. Um, and by the time I actually got back to, to, to being employed there, um, I was I was convinced that I, I wanted to actually start brewing. Um, so after a very, very short stint at a Japanese company, um, uh, I, I joined a, a brewery who, who I knew from my time on my exchange program uh, at university, mm-hmm. um, a local sake brewery in Okayama. Um, and I, I got in touch with them. Uh, and uh, yeah, they took a chance on a foreigner, the first time anyone in the prefecture, I'm told. Um, and I became a Kurobito, um, where I was mm. there for just under three years. Um, but to, to, to sort of progress that, or progress my career, I suppose, um, I, I, again, I already knew um, Imada-san, the, um, the Kuramoto Toji um, from, uh, from the brand Fukucho, um, and they had an opening. So I, I moved to where I am now, uh, where I'm speaking from, uh, which is a small town of Akitsu uh, along the Seto Inland Sea uh, in Hiroshima Prefecture. Uh, and I've just finished mm-hmm. my second season uh, uh, brewing there. So that's, that's the brief, okay. uh, the brief um, CV. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it's amazing to move from, from Britain to Japan and become a Kurabita because... It's it's a very demanding job. It's it's very physically demanding, and I guess it's a very steep learning curve. And also language wise, even if you studied Japanese before, again, it should be tough. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, absolutely. I mean, it's it's not an easy job, um, and and that it certainly doesn't help um, when you're doing it in your second language. Um, and of, and of course, you know a lot of the the um, you know the vocabulary we use around sake, um, as one of my friends calls nihon shugo, or you know, um, you know sake talk, sake speak, or the language mm. of sake. You know, th- these are these are words that most Japanese people don't know either. Um, so so yeah, initially when I went into the into the brewery. Um, it was extremely difficult just to just to understand what my colleagues were, were saying and talking about, but it but it does start to you know to, to get a, a bit easier. Um, but I'd, but I'd be lying if I said even now five year or five seasons in, um, it, it isn't the, the probably the most difficult aspect of of the job, um, including above the the physical demands that it puts on your body. It's the it's the constant strain of having to, to, to listen to people, you know, shouting above, you know, noisy equipment and things in a language that you're not familiar with. So, but at the same time, it's, it's, um, it's also a very, very fulfilling job uh, if, if sake brewing is your thing, which, which it is for me. So, Yeah, now there are several people who work uh, in Japan as Kurabito, as Toji, as Filokapo, or... Um, but some of them more on the marketing side. I, I know quite quite a lot, of, well, not quite a lot, of, but a number of people who worked at the breweries, but usually on the marketing side, on the promotion side, because it probably makes sense to, to have somebody from outside Japan uh, promoting uh, sake uh, internationally. But it's very few people who actually brew sake in Japan who are not Japanese. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite an amazing story. Do you remember your aha moment or eureka moment with Sakia? Or it was more like a gradual progression when you tried it and you think, oh yeah, it's probably something in it, and then you've grown liking it? I suppose it's a bit of both. There, there's been three moments that, that stick out that if, if you know if you're to, to look at the, the the gradual steps that I made to make you know what is a, not just a career but a life changing decision to um yeah. to, to you know to join a you know a very old company like a sake brewery and just you know completely change your lifestyle and you know half of the year you spend in a cold dark building but yeah, there, there, there's three very memorable moments, um, and and they all involve just exceptional sake that 
you know, takes your breath away um, and, and, you know, motivates you to, you know, to make that push. And yeah, I suppose all of them really have relevance to tonight's topic as well, because all of them have, were made from, uh, you know, very distinctive um, or very different yeast varieties, um, which, uh, which which obviously played a, a big role in the uh, in the final sake. Um, but but the, the three sake, just to name them uh, in in order, would be um, the, the the first brewery I worked for sake. Well, the brewery is called Juha Chizakari, but I, I tried um, a very highly aromatic, uh, made with a very mm-hmm. modern strain of yeast, uh, Daiginjo at um, a, a sake matsuri in, in Okayama Prefecture when I was a student. Um, and, and it kind of, as I said, it kind of just blew me away. It could, I couldn't believe, you know, hmm. that, that, that this was, um, you know, that this was made from, from rice. Um, but the, the, the next one, um, and I'll come back to this sake actually because um, I, I want to, to talk a bit, a bit more about it later. But um, sure. I was in a bar in, in Kyoto. I'll try and keep the story short. But uh, I was in a bar in Kyoto when I was working at the first Japanese company, a very ill-fated endeavor um, and, and I really didn't like it and I was working late and on the way home I would always look at this uh, izakaya that had all these sake bottles lined up but it, it was only um, towards the end of my time that I pluck up the courage to walk into this place um, and I didn't really know much that much about sake at the time and they presented me with this very friendly barman but he, re- he presented me this huge extensive list of sake and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And he, I think he see, saw me struggling and he, he said, well, where are you from? And I said, the, the UK. And the next minute a bottle was put in front of me and it was Tamagawa. And he mm. said, this, this was made by one of your um, fellow countrymen. And it was just extraordinary. I mean, <laughs> you know, just yeah. nothing I'd ever drank um, before uh, and, and probably ever since really. And, you know, it was at that point that actually, you know, that was what motivated me to, to start my own blog and my own website was that, that one experience that I just wanted everyone to, to, to know about this, this sake. And that, that was probably the, one of the first posts I ever made was about that sake. But yeah, the, the last one is Bijofu from Kochi, uh, just an incredible sake. And it, yeah. it caught me at the right moment again in Kyoto, but I'd already decided to be a Kurabito by that point and it just you know justified all the decisions I was about to make and um, because that was the one that I thought great I'm gonna go and get to make this stuff now so and um, so yeah sorry long story but that's that's the three that you know really kind of put me down the path to uh, to obsession <laughs> yeah 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 it's, it's quite interesting progression from highly aromatic daiginja to tamagawa which is quite distinctive sake it's it's yeah i agree that it's very difficult to compare it to anything and then going to bijofu yeah um as i said um you know highly yeah. aromatic ginjo sake it's not really what i choose to drink anymore um but it, mm-hmm. you know, it caught me at the mm-hmm. right time and um you know in in the right you know in the right situation gin, ginjo is is a fantastic drink and yeah, that that yeah. one, for, you know, for me was a very memorable uh, experience. Just you know, good company, good good place, good situation, yeah. and, and obviously the, the the added thing that you're thinking about the future, and you know that that was uh, that was a very very special glass of sake for me. <laughs> when you in the midst of the brewing season, what is your typical day at the brewery? I mean, obviously, the sake brewing involves getting up early. Um, some some brewers get away with it and um, we don't at my company unfortunately and um, so so typically in the in the winter I mean we work every day obviously maybe one day a month we'll we'll, um, we'll, we'll get off but some sometimes not at all and mm. um, but yeah we don't normally start and um, get up get up in the morning about four o'clock and um, obviously live very very close to the brewery so you don't really have much time before you get started obviously you need to get a big breakfast in because you're not going to eat again until about lunchtime so so yeah normally start um, anywhere from five to, to half past five and obviously the the first couple of hours are pretty intense you, you, there's a lot of preparation for the the main the main event of the whole day which is mashing so preparing the rice steamer towards the end of this mm-hmm. season I was 
lucky enough to be tasked um, with a position called motoya, which is the the person who makes the the moto or the yeast starter. So so there's that kind of preparation, and then you, you obviously mash up until really once you've cleaned everything and everything, you, you're 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 at lunchtime, and then there's usually some other big job mm-hmm. uh, in the afternoon, whether it be pressing or um, bottling or there, there's there's a whole um, you know plethora of jobs that they can they can task you with and mm-hmm. Imara San we don't have a very late finish to be fair we, we so we start at about half past, half past five and we finish at five um, which is actually quite good because some brewers have to go mm-hmm. back in to do um, late night work in, uh, for, to, to handle Koji um, but at our brewery our Koji does all of that um, by herself so so which is very extraordinary really <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that's that's yeah. a that's a typical yeah. day uh, in, in the brewery. So, and it starts in autumn and ends in somewhere in April, May. Um, yeah, so this yeah, I mean, there, there's this there's this old old adage that brewers brew in the winter. I think we really need to revisit that because it's it's not the case. Um, we we brew, yes, you know, um, mm-hmm. autumn, uh, late autumn. We we started this year uh, mm-hmm. at the tail end of September was the first time we steamed a batch of rice. Mm-hmm. And if I told you that today um, my job was to, to clean our sake press, which we've been doing for the last three days, um, you know, we're still packing up. Um, but actually we were, yeah. we actually extended our season this year. Um, so so we, we actually kind of ran, not behind schedule, it, we, our original schedule was extended. So... It's later than normal, but this was the longest brewing season I've ever participated in. Hmm. Okay, so so how do you cope with this all this physical stress? Because it's it's physically demanding. Um, sake in the evening helps. Um, that that certainly helps for your uh, you know <laughs> yeah. for your mental well being, or, or certainly th- does for me. So yeah, a, ni- a nice glass of warm or a nice cup, sorry, I should say, of warm sake when you when you get in the door, and a nice yeah. hot meal um, certainly helps. But yeah, b- basically, it's it's early starts and it's and it's early to bed. The, you, there's no way you can burn the candle at both ends, as they say, because you you know you're, you're already doing that mm-hmm. effectively. Um, so so I'm I'm normally I, I have a a young son. Um, and you know, in the brewing season, I, I would fall mm-hmm. asleep before him. Um, so it's, it's kind of um, yeah. you know, that's the, the, the kind yeah. of level you get to after half past seven. My eyes start to, to go, um, and you know, half past yeah. eight, it's it's uh, it's all over and it's another day. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely lots of sleep. Your social life is on hold. Um, you know, maybe maybe try and get you know. And half an hour to an hour to to do something, watch a watch a bit of a film or something like that, um, certainly helps. Um, mm-hmm. uh, again, for your own mental well-being of just not thinking for for a, for a, a, a short period of time, um, you know yeah. that that's about it. And, and try and eat eat as uh, healthily as possible. Well, that's kind of be lying. I said that I adhere to that one all the time. So. Yeah, but yeah, it's 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 a it's a, it's a definitely a um you know it's it's not a sprint, <laughs> um you know you need to no, you need to pace no. yourself. So, but you enjoy it. You you come to the brewery happily every day. Abs- absolutely, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it if if I didn't. I, I think I've I've met some people in the industry that you know they're they're kind of they're not into sake brewing or sake in any way, which is absolutely fine. Um, but but to me, I, I I can't get my head around that. I, you know, um, if if it wasn't for the, the passion for brewing sake, I, I just you know there's I would I would genuinely want to just do something else. Um, but but for me, it's it's a personally it's a fantastic job, particularly at my level, which is you know I'm just you know a mere beginner in this you know yeah. solve this great mystery of sake. Every day is is a steep learning curve, um, and I and I don't see that changing in the foreseeable future. And that's really what keeps you know work interesting is when you're you know, yeah. constantly um, challenged and constantly kept on your toes. And um, so so yeah, I, I love it. I mean, don't get me wrong. February is a tough month. Um, it's kind of 
<laughs> known among brewers for whatever reason. I think it's the end is not in sight yet, um, but you've really been going for a long time and it gets kind of miserable. Um, but there's real high points as well, um, you know, throughout, you know, when, when you press a batch of sake, for example, um, yeah. you know, and you get to try it straight from the press. And, you know, that's, that's a real kind of uh, job done, you know, it's, you know, you really feel like something tangible has been achieved. So, so yes, yeah, uh, for, for me, it's great. And, and I think anyone that's really into brewing would, would love it as well. Okay, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I thinking that we probably should connect again and to talk just about your Krabita life. Let's move to our main subject, sake yeast. What role does sake yeast play in sake brewing? Um, well, to put it bluntly, a very, very big role in, in, sake, in sake brewing. I mean, it, it wouldn't be unfair to say that um, sake yeast is really the unsung hero of sake brewing. Um, you know, much like um, grapes with, um, with wine production, you know, when most people talk about, um, you know, sake, they, talk, they, they obviously talk about rice, you know, as, as the main ingredient. Um, but but sake um, yeast plays a, a huge role on the the outcome of of sake. Um, you know the, the obvious ones are aromatics. You know the the, the, the aromas uh, and and the, that that's that's an obvious one. Um, but mm-hmm. when you you know when you consider that seventy percent of the, the the acid compounds in sake come from the yeast, um, you know that. Mm-hmm. that you know, acidity is hugely important for um, for, for sake brewing. Eh, for, for for sake, um, if you think uh, to get to give you an, an example, we make a product at the brewery called seafood. Um, now, it's not the only reason why it has high acidity, um, but it, it is one of the reasons um, because of the the, the type of um, yeast that we use. Now, if you Look at the sweetness level, the the, the SMV, the sake meter value. It's way down, like minus twenty, minus thirty, depending on the batch. Um, but because of the acidity, um, it doesn't taste cloying, and it doesn't taste um, it doesn't actually taste particularly sweet either. So the acidity is actually affecting, um, you know, the, the the sweetness and dryness, uh, your perception of of those as well. Um, so it's it's a very very um, vital piece of the of the jigsaw um, in you know in, in how you perceive the aromatics and the you know the the, the taste of the um, the actual sake. So yeah, I mean some would argue maybe even more so than rice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so is sake is different from other yeasts like bread, wine, beer. So yeast is used for many, many products. Is it different or? Um, yes. I mean, some of the ones you mentioned, they're like wine yeast and stuff. The, the, the yeast they use for sake brewing is, uh, is, is, I suppose you could call it a cousin um, of those. And it, 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 obviously its, its job is to, um, you know, to turn sugars or glucose um, you know, into, into alcohol. Very, very key, obviously, in, uh, in any alcoholic beverage. Um, but the, the actual, if you want to look at the difference, you just need to, to, to look at the sort of rudimentaries of what sake brewing is. Um, so sake brewing is yeah. typically done at much lower temperatures uh, in comparison to, to a lot of other alcoholic beverages. Um, so so that's, that's one thing that needs to be, um, you know, yeast needs to be able to withstand um, these colder temperatures. Um, it also tends to be, particularly in the realms of ginjo uh, scuri or ginjo production, tends to go on for quite a long time. 30 days is kind of now the norm for a batch of ginjo, but there's there's a lot more creativity going on and you hear of moroni that go for 40 days and some of them 50 days. And it starts to get yeah. to crazy territory. Um, so it, it needs to be very, very strong as well. Um, but, but the last thing is obviously um, Nihonshu is the, the highest naturally fermenting beverage in the world. Um, you know, bef- above this, you're talking distilled alcohol, uh, distilled beverages. Um, so it also needs to be very, very, um, you know, strong against alcohol. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't get these high alcohol contents, which are obviously the trademark mm-hmm. uh, characteristic of, uh, of Nihonshu. 
Do you know a bit of history about how yeast has developed? Because I think, obviously, in old times, yeast was used what, like in any other beverages, the, the yeast which lived probably in the air on the on the walls of the brewery, on the ceiling. But nowadays, you, you hear that people use different yeasts. So I guess they take it from somewhere. So do you know how it developed? Yeah, I mean, it developed out of a, originally out of a need. Um, as you say, um, or, or basically a need after technological advances were made in brewing, um, which admittedly were made for tax purposes. Um, you know, mm-hmm. um, sake brewing um, in Japan, you know, towards the beginning of the, the Meiji period, the, 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 the impetus changed because it became a major um, source of taxation for, for the Japanese governments. So there was a lot of research started to go into to sake brewing. There was a lot of organizations like the Brewing Society of Japan and then later the National Research Institute of Brewing and stuff. These were all founded, obviously, to, to support um, the, the sake industry. And as you said, in the past, they were using uh, ambient yeasts or yase kobo, uh, as they say in Japanese. M- most in, amongst brewing circles, they tend to say yane ski kobo, um, which literally means yeast that clings to the rafters. So um, all natural yeasts in the environment, and you really had no idea um, what you were going to get. And the failure rate match that kind of unpredictability of the yeast that we're using and um, so it was it was a very unstable form of brewing and failed batches were were were, were quite normal now at that time you're talking um you know the kimoto or the or uh, for a very very brief period the yamahai method and um, i won't go into that i'm sure you can do another podcast but um <laughs> yeah. right about the, the turn of the 20th century they made they, they, they discovered this uh, method of making the, the yeast starter called sokujo, um, and it literally means mm-hmm. fast brew. Now, that calls for cultured yeasts. So when they had this new technology, this new method, um, they needed to, um, to have yeasts available for distribution. And that was where you got the, the numbered system that you have um, today, or what they call kyokai kobo, uh, association yeasts. Originally, I think it was really just one yeast, um, which they called first-class yeast. But basically, again, with all the, the, the emphasis on improvement, um, they changed to a numbered system. And um, what they would actually do was they would, they, would, they would identify breweries that were consistently producing good sake. Um, and they would, mm-hmm. go to these, um, they would go to that brewery and they would isolate the yeast. And then they would um, make it a... a an actual product that they could then distribute to uh, nationwide to, to the breweries. Um, but it's, it's very interesting if you look at the history of it, you, you can actually see the, the, the changing of, you know, these regions that were, you know, that were considered very, very strong at the time. And then it kind of moves to the next region and, and so on and so on. Um, so you have a really fascinating sort of journey from, from NADA um, where the first um, mm-hmm. Kyokai uh, number one, uh, Association East number one, was isolated. And then it moves to Fushimi as uh, a lot of advances were made in brewing at Geikeikan. Uh, and then it goes to Hiroshima, which is a, which is a, a relatively new region for, for sake brewing in that sense. Um, and, and that there is the three big brewing regions of, of Japan. Um, and then after that, you can see it going more diverse into places like Tohoku and, and you know, these kind of things. So it, it, there, there is actually a pattern that you can view just by looking at these association yeasts. Hmm. Do you know if there was any kind of resistance from the breweries to, to open their yeast? Because I guess some breweries, they considered probably the yeast as a unique advantage over other breweries. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, from, from what from what my understanding is, from what I've heard on it, the the, the, the breweries in general were quite reluctant. Um, you know, it's, it you know still is sometimes quite a conservative industry, uh, and the the uptake on these yeasts was um, was not great. And um, it was only the, the the game changer, I suppose, was number six, which most people refer to in Japan as Aramasa Kobo. 
So that number six was was a wartime yeast, effectively. I think in 1940, it was the mm-hmm. only uh, yeast that you could actually it w- was actually in distribution. Um, but it was it was very very stable, and it could be uh, it could withstand very very cold temperatures. Um, you know, obviously, consider, consider where it came from. You know, Aramasa is way up in the north, um, or sorry, the east, I should say, in Japan's case. Um, and that that yeast was the one that opened people's eyes to um, to, to the stability mm-hmm. that they can introduce to their to their brewery, um, and it kind of kicked off from uh, from there. Um, and again, you can see from number seven up until about you know number ten, you can you can identify the changing of the trends as the um, as the yeasts kind of you know developed. Um, so so yeah, num- number six is a is a hugely important yeast in that. Uh, in the current, uh, it still is in the current lineup. So, mm-hmm. so it's quite quite interesting to probably to see the map. How you know these uh, maps when they talk about wars and they show how the troops were moving around the country, and to see the <laughs> same sort of map for how yeast, <laughs> you know, going from one region to another one and with red big arrows. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is interesting. I mean, there's no sort of fixed way that you could say it's definitely this and it's definitely that but that you know you start to connect the dots on these things and you know when if you look at number five and um, association east number five was um or, or actually if you look at uh, three four and five were all identified um or isolated from breweries in uh, hiroshima um, so number five mm-hmm. was kamatsuru number four was an unknown location and number three was sushi um, in Mihara, um, but so num- number six was was uh, way up in Akita, so it starts to kind of diversify from that point. Um, but number seven was in Nagano, um, and I, mm-hmm. I, I read somewhere that um, the, the 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 brewery um, that's famous for the Masumi brand, um, they at the time they actually consulted a lot with breweries in Hiroshima. Um, because it was a very very strong uh, region for sake brewing at the time, and the, mm-hmm. you know what what was being explained to them was the importance of cleanliness and, and making sure everything was was um, was clean inside the brewery, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, and they were they were consulting with uh, with this brewery in Nagano, um, and you know lo and mm-hmm. behold you have number seven comes from uh, from from this brewery who's probably thinking a bit outside the box by um, by consulting with a, with a brewery uh, all the way down in Hiroshima. Um, but, you know, when you hear about the, the tale of that whips, uh, that, that number seven yeast, mm-hmm. they do say that they didn't do anything particularly special. It just they kept this clean environment for this yeast to mm-hmm. proliferate. Um, so, so, yeah, it, there, there's, there's various ways you can link the dots on these things. Um, but, yeah. but none of it can be, be said for certain, obviously. So it's very, very interesting. Oh yeah, sake yeast is such a fascinating topic. So many things to talk about and so many things to learn. But before we continue, let me remind you about London Sake, our sponsor, and the huge selection of curated sake sets, which provide a great opportunity to explore various style and types of sake. Have a look. But don't forget about the magic word SUGIDAMA, all caps, to get your 10% discount. Back to yeast. Okay. So you you, you touched upon the uh, next questions about um, how yeast affects sake taste and other things but in general you talked about acidity are there any other areas in sake production and sake taste and aroma that very dependent on the yeast of course sake's ingredients are very very simple um, so all of the ingredients have some effect um, you know and, and influence mm-hmm. the, the, the sake in a great way um, but when you say aroma, the, the aroma in something, not just in sake, but it affects your perception of taste as well. Um, so, you know, mm-hmm. if, if you look at it, um, you look at it as a picture, as a, as a whole picture, 
it does just more than just simple, you know, it affects the aroma or it affects the acidity. It's affecting the, the, the whole um, beverage as a whole and the taste that you, you perceive as well. Um, so obviously um, out, outside of that, outside of these kind of things, um, the, the yeasts that, that are used, there's a, there's a huge spectrum, uh, you know, available now. And as I just mentioned, not all of them are association yeasts. Um, but, you know, yeasts that can produce higher alcohol, for example, um, and, you know, if you've got yeasts that are producing higher alcohol, then that obviously affects whether something's full-bodied or whether something is light. Um, you've got certain yeasts like um, number 10, um, which is, you know, I, I always call that the tohoku yeast. Um, you know, it, it's become synonymous with the, the tanri karakuchi style. Um, so, so, yeah, they, they are... You know, you, you can take certain yeasts and apply them to to certain types of sake that you're wanting to to, to make. You know, something that the toji envisions in his head, um, and some are just simply suited better than others um, for certain styles. So, okay, so can we talk about um, probably a couple of or probably top three yeast used in sake brewing? Because obviously there are quite a lot of yeast at the moment. But some of them very popular, some of them probably not very popular. Yeah, of course. I mean, of course, nowadays the trend is for, um, you know, highly, highly aromatic ginjo, uh, what they call ginjo ka. Um, so the, 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 the mm-hmm. two, they're, they're ester compounds effectively. So you have isomyl acetate and ethyl capriot. So in, in Japanese, the, 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 the big buzzword for the last 10 years um, has been caperon, uh, which is the or caperon san, um, which is the the, the the latter word that I just said in Japanese. The, the most popular one is number seven, um, and number seven mm-hmm. I suppose got the wheels turning um, or got the wheels going in that direction. Um, so it was the first yeast that um, that displayed ginjoka um, or, or in any great level. I'm told that the the previous, uh, you know, one to five, some of them actually produced gin- ginjoka, but it, it wouldn't have likely been seen as as a positive thing back then. Mm-hmm. Um, but number seven kind of got the wheels turning, and um, it was at one point the, the the yeast of choice for the the national sake competition, uh, the Kampiokai. But again, as I say, you can follow the trends. So number seven is still the most widely used yeast in Japan. Very very versatile, and it mm-hmm. still can make some aromatics number nine is another one that is still hugely popular amongst brewers more leaning towards the sort of appley um aromas that that i mentioned before very very robust um you know it can it can ferment at lower temperatures so so again it's, it's a very um popular yeast and i used it at my um, my first brewery outside of that i, I don't know that this would be for sure, but I'm going to hazard a guess that a lot of sake produced mm-hmm. is probably using 1801, um, which is one of the more modern, um, highly aromatic yeasts. Um, again, I used that at my my first brewery, um, and it's, it's a very interesting sake. I, I don't really go for that kind of sake now as, as a personal preference, um, but it's quite mm-hmm. incredible that the, the aromatics that, that can come from it. What you what you tend to notice is the the the, the, the more higher the aromatics in the yeast, um, the the weaker it will be f- when it's fermenting, um, and they, they tend to the, the fermentation tends to tail off quite quickly, um, and that kind of lends itself to slightly sweeter sake that doesn't ferment as fully as say number seven or number nine. Mm-hmm. But if 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 I was to guess, I would say that probably they are the the, the three um, most widely used. Um, sake today and um, certainly seven is definitely the most used but um, after that there's so many out there it'd be hard to, to keep <laughs> i don't know maybe the information yeah there. yeah it's so many do you know some un- unusual yeast you come across which you say oh it's it's interesting or it's it's not in the trend but people use it for something particular um, yeah, I mean, there's 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 quite a few. Um, you know, there's there's yeasts now that that are available. Um, you know, association yeasts that are available. 
um, that do things like uh, they make um, you know very specific types of acidity. And um, so you now, if you mm-hmm. want, if you want kind of you know, you know sort of zesty citrus um, kind of acidity, then there's there's yeasts that can actually produce you know these specific compounds now. Um, so there there really is a kind of whole you know spectrum out there now of of what they can do. There's there's yeasts that um, very very good for producing high alcohol. Um, if if that's mm-hmm. you know if that's what you're what you're intending on uh, on doing, um, but I would say the most interesting ones are the ones that you can't actually identify. Um, you know the the there's a there's a sort of moving trend almost for for brewers to go back to um, the way it was um, before these association yeast and and give their you know try their hand at um, you know at ambient yeasts. Um, and they, they can produce some really unique uh, types of flavor components and uh, aroma components. Um, and I suppose it's, 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 if, if everyone's using the same yeast, there's, there's bound to be a lot of crossover. Um, but these associate, these um, you know, ambient yeasts um, are, are probably quite specific to, to their location. So, um, so yeah, de- definitely they're the, um, if you want something sort of, um, left field then then definitely try these ones out i see but with ambient yeast it, it's quite difficult to control the consistency of sake with year mm-hmm. over year because obviously you've got yeast which lives in in the brewery but it might change evolve and and so on so it's quite difficult i guess to to, to use it I mean, I guess that's the appealing part. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's something, um, there is something appealing about, you know, about that type of unknown. But, but yeah, for, for sure, I, I 100% agree. Um, it takes a very, very brave um, toji to, um, you know, to, to do that uh, year in, year out, because um, it's hard enough doing it with tried and tested uh, association yeasts um, you know, you still come into plenty of problems with, with these. Um, but to do it, um, the brewers, and there really is not that many of them, but um, the, the brewers that do that, you, you have to um, take your hat off to them because um, the, the, the stress level of literally putting this very expensive collection of ingredients together and, and then not knowing yeah. what's going to come out is, uh, is truly remarkable. So. What is uh, formless yeast? Um, so awanashi, as they say, or awanashi kobo in uh, Japanese, it's exactly that. It's it's yeast that that doesn't foam, and they've they've identified um, a, a foam gene very specific to sake uh, sake yeast as well. Don't ask me the technicalities of it. I'm not uh, <laughs> mm. not it goes beyond my pay grade as a as a lowly brewer, but. Um, they've identified a way that they can kind of cancel out that that element of the, mm-hmm. um, the microorganism, um, and what you have is you have effectively duplicates of um, the s- several of the association yeasts, and some of the yeast. One of the yeasts I mentioned, um, eighteen zero one, is is only mm-hmm. non foaming, um, and th- th- the you know that because it says zero one on the end of the on the number. So that is the um, the, the way that you tell if a yeast is non-foaming or not is if it has that um, that zero one. But there, there's obviously a number of um, advantages to um, to using uh, you know awanashi kobo. Um, you know number one is there, there's a lot of stress and maintenance with um, with using uh, foaming yeasts. Um, the, the the yeast that's, the, the 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 foam itself contains a lot of yeast cells. Um, and if it overflows from a tank, um, then you're you're going to really weaken the fermentation, and that that could be disastrous. And um, so what brewers have to do is they have to you know you know fill them a lot less than their capacity. Um, and obviously you know the logistics over the course of a season that means that there's a there's a lot tighter logistics in managing the tanks. And for some brewers it can be a real big deal. So using uh, foamless yeast means that you can kind of max out your your space in the tank, 
and obviously you don't need to um, to clean the foam every every morning uh, off of, of the tanks. And I, I did that job for for two three years, um, and it's it's a formidable job. Um, you know you you have to that that foam rises and you know and peaks and troughs, um, and you you know some some very unwanted bacteria can gather quite easily in in the, in the foam if you if you leave it stuck to the site of the tank and then obviously once it drops into the tank then you know you can have um undesirable elements so you have to clean that and um, that off but the, the, the flip side is it's, it's actually a very very big discussion in the industry at the moment is whether or not these yeasts are actually um the, the same as their you know their foaming counterparts and there's there's a lot of um, there's many many prominent people in the industry and that have experience using both that, that say that they are not the same. Ignoring the fact that from a brewer's perspective, the foam is actually a very, very good way to, to tell the condition of a mash. And, um, you know, that, that foam is not random. It, it, there, there's a whole um, spectrum of, of stages that it goes through and they all actually have very, very interesting names. Um, and you, you can you can tell you know very very succinctly where the um, where you know what stage that that mash is at just by looking at the foam, uh, and you don't have that with um, with foamless ones. So it's, it's it's something else to have to, to think about. You're just purely going by data um, when you ana- analyze tanks, and that that's the stage of the uh, the monomy. And a lot of toys you would would prefer to to see it with their own eyes. Um, but there's more technical explanations as well as to why foamless might not be as as good as um, the, the, the the foaming ones. So so yeah, it's it's a real big um, topic of debate uh, in the industry right now. It's quite interesting because when you think about it, you're thinking, oh yeah, if it's foamless, probably it's better. But um, if breweries don't use it um, all the time, so it means some kind of advantages and disadvantages as in everything else. Yeah. So we, when the breweries decide what yeast to use, what kind of the process they go through to decide? I mean, obviously, they probably have sake that they've been brewing for years. They use the same yeast. But when they're thinking about some new sake, do they think about, okay, what yeast we're going to use or they... I don't know. What is the kind of process of choosing the yeast? Um, well, for all the reasons that we mentioned earlier, um, it's, it's a very, very uh, important decision. Um, you know, in, in for, for example, hypothetically, if, if, a, if a master brewer is deciding um, to make a new brand um, or a new product, um, you know, one of the things they're probably going to going to look at is well, they can't change the the water. Um, you know, the the water. Um, well, realistically, they can't change the water. So, so you know, if they're using soft water or hard water, then that's pretty much fixed and determined. Um, but they can change the rice. Um, so, so the rice is going to play a big part. You know, certain rice strains behave better, certain are more tricky, certain uh, certain rice varieties yield, you know, certain, you know, quirks and unique tastes. Um, but it's never, um, you know, sort of earth shattering stuff and um, you know Yamada Nishiki is a nice comfortable uh, brewer's rice to use uh, Omachi is the opposite so so there there's there's one part in the creation process but outside of that one way that they can really kind of impact something is obviously the yeast and um, so if they're making um, you know if the if the, the the goal is to make um you know a really kind of food friendly everyday drinkable Junmai shoe um, then you're not going to want, you know, this this you know extremely highly aromatic, you know, something like 1801. Um, you're probably going to want something like number six, number seven, or maybe even number nine. And um, so, so yeah, that that's the the, the, the creative process. I assume these tojis and uh, these master brewers go through um, before they before they pick a yeast. But the other thing as well is. There, there's, there is also an element of people looking for regionality in their, their sake as well. Um, like, like I said, certain prefectures have their own research institutes um, and they're, uh, some of them are more active than others. 
you know, at, at my current brewery, we use only um, outside of one Kyokai Association yeast, um, we uh, we use all Hiroshima yeast. Um, so so there's there's also that factor as well. But um, some breweries obviously want to, um, to to keep something that links it to to their their home prefecture as well. Okay. I, I guess there is constant research into yeast, and some new yeast appear probably every year. So what do you think we'll see in the future in terms of new yeasts and what the, let's say, scientists, psychiatric scientists trying to achieve, trying to find, trying to develop? Well, this again is a very, very interesting question because um, <laughs> if you look at if, if what we talked about before, if you, you know, if you consider that the yeasts really up to this point, you know, from number six to, you know, to the current yeast have followed trends. Um, you know, the, the, these high aromatic yeasts um, really sort of started to level up, um, you know, from the 1980s and, you know, the, the ginjo booms that, that followed. Um, but there's there's kind of, you know, murmurings within the industry right now, which I'm sure have not restricted to, to just Japan, um, that, you know, maybe with, I suppose, consumers becoming a bit more aware about sake and, you know, starting to become a bit more uh, maybe adventurous in what they drink. Some people have even suggested that COVID has led to obviously a lot more people drinking at home. So they're, what they're wanting a bit more food friendly sake. And um, there, there are, as I said, murmurings within the industry that what you're seeing is more of a shift towards lower aromatic sake. So sake that doesn't have these, you know, really full on aromatics. Um, sake that is a bit more, um, you know, food friendly, a bit more everyday. Certainly, Kimoto, the Kimoto style and Yamaha styles are definitely starting to, um, to become more widespread and more available. I don't know is the is the simple thing, but it it would be interesting if we started to see maybe we've seen the climax of these um, aromatic yeasts. I mean, some of them these ones are incredibly aromatic, so. You, you kind of think, well, maybe we've reached that that pinnacle now, um, and and who knows, maybe it's going to start to to go down the way, um, and you're going to see ones that more um, focus on acidity or low, lesser aromatics. So so yeah, who knows? But it's it's a very very interesting uh, topic for the uh, for the industry. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, it's we we just probably scratched the surface of the topic about yeast talking about it for for an hour so it's uh, it's definitely a very interesting topic and uh, the more i don't geeky you are it's the more interesting it for i guess for people and uh, to understand and another thing is obviously you don't see what yeast is used in particular sake very often so on on the labels they don't necessarily put ye- the yeast they sometimes put in the some notes on the website but uh, definitely not on the bottle so it's, it's quite interesting probably if you want to compare different yeasts you have to do your research to find the sake made of with uh, number seven and sake made with number 18 for example and compare them so it's it's it's, it's very interesting topic so <laughs> thanks a lot for talking about it and uh, no it's fine i could talk about it easily <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can imagine we, we probably could spend another couple of hours talking about any particular aspect of this topic if we've got time. Yeah. So at the end of each episode, I ask my guests to introduce sake they like or got some kind of particular affection to, and uh, they want to tell our listeners about it so would you like to do that i'm um, sure well you, you gave me a brief that um it, it should be a sake that's available in the uk um so yeah. I, I have to say um for, for something that's um relevant to tonight's topic um i, I would recommend um tamagawa um, spontaneous fermentation um but the red label one the red label one i believe you probably get the white label one as well but the, the, the red label one in particular, because it's the one that I mentioned from that time that, you know, I, I, I tried it and 
and you know really blew my mind when I when I tried it. Um, and it, and it's a real um, it's a very good example of um, just how big an impact um, that that sake yeast can can have um, you know on the final product. You know that that sake from memory is made with a table rice, I believe. Um, so it, it doesn't have you know expensive brewers rice adding big boisterous big billowing flavors or anything like say a Yamada Nishiki or an Omachi or anything it's an extraordinary drink and you know really well if you've only tried things like aromatic sake before um, it will definitely cause you to have a, a real rethink um, but, it, but it is also a real good example of the, the impact that, um, that yeast can have on the final product. So yeah, give, give it a give it a try if you can, but definitely be careful because it's uh, it's not what you would call low alcohol. Do you recommend it at uh, to drink at any particular temperature or? Absolutely, any temperature is good for that sake. Um, the brewer himself will urge you to to drink it extremely hot. Um, and, and certainly I've done that um, many times, but it, it's it's equally as comfortable, um, you know, actually chilled um, as, as a lot of their, their sake is. Um, it is. For me, it's the mark of a, of a really um, complex, deep sake is that you can try it at just about any temperature. But yeah, de- definitely, I suppose, you know, warm, you know, warming sake of that ilk um, adds a new dimension to it. Um, but, mm. but slightly chilling it as well um, it is 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 also perfectly okay. You know, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's each to their own. It's a subjective it's a subjective you know thing. So um, so yeah, definitely experiment with it, any flavor. But the, the, the thing to really remember um, is that sake was made with ambient yeast that was um, you know that was floating naturally in the brewery since you know who, who knows when um and uh, and yeah that's that's uh, that's how it was made so um it's an extraordinary sake just for that point alone so yeah absolutely agree it's 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 amazing sake and uh, i met philip harper a couple of years ago just pre-covid at um, japan house here in london and i remember he was talking about this sake, and he was as you said was talking about like um you should drink it at 70 degrees and I was thinking, 70 degrees, it's a gyokuro tea or something rather than sake. But he was, uh, I think he did some tasting at some restaurant, a ramen restaurant here in London, and uh, he was serving it at 70 degrees. And he said people were like, loved it. So, yeah. Yeah, well, one, one thing on, on um, you know, warming sake, sort of go, go slightly off topic, it doesn't just apply to, to, to Tamagawa by, by no means, but... Um, it's good practice anyway when, or I think it's good practice anyway when you buy a bottle of sake um, to, to warm it up to the extremes and then try it on the way back down. Um, and you know, mm. it, it might not be great at that temperature, some sake isn't. Um, but what you'll do is you will find the sweet spot um, on its way down. Um, and there's kind of a negative connotation with this word sometimes in Japan, but there's a word called kanzamashi. Uh, and it just means that, you know, the sake is, that's been left to cool. Um, but it feels like now that word has kind of taken a, a new, new meaning, um, and you, mm-hmm. you hear of a lot of um, you know people doing that in Japan certainly. Um, that they, 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 it's a good quick way to, to test its temperature range, um, and you might find that it's you know towards the lower end of that, or you might find that it's the best temperature was seventy. Um, so so yeah, it's the, that that's the the real beauty of sake. <laughs> you can do that with it. Don't don't try that at home with wine, kids. It's uh, <laughs> it's not going to be a yeah. sensation. So, um, so so yeah. But that but that one in particular is uh, delightful when it's warmed. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting because I've never tried to to go down. I usually I usually put sake in the fridge and then I take it out and uh, I drink it chilled and then it's got room temperature and then I warm it up. But uh, it's quite interesting to try. The another way around to, to warm it up and then go to the you know room temperature and probably have it uh, from the fridge. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends. It depends on the mood and things like that. I mean, hard, hard yeah. hardcore hardcore Atkan drinkers will drink warm sake, you know, in the in the midst of summer in Japan, um, 
you know, I'm yeah. not quite at that level. Um, you know, so, <laughs> so yeah, I, I know, you know, I often drink in the same fashion that you just mentioned is, you know, you start it off out of the fridge and, and in my experience, most sake doesn't taste good out of the fridge. Um, it's, it's too, there are exceptions. And again, that's just my personal preference, but I tend to find you need to let sake just, just warm, you know, warm just a little bit out of the fridge. Um, or it'll be, you know, too closed and sometimes a little bitter as well. It doesn't do a lot of sake any good to be to be extremely chill. Um, but yeah, you can let it, you yeah. know, go go the other way as well. So, um, but yeah, it, isn't it isn't it so interesting that you can do that with it? So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. It's 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 amazing drink because of one of the reasons is that you can experiment with it in many many different ways and. Uh, enjoy it every time yeah well you know after after listening to this hopefully the the, the, the yeast element will become enjoyable as well and um, you know it's, it's yeah. interesting a lot of a lot of them um, you know you know consumers quite rightly focus a lot on on the rice and um, but a lot of brewers certainly they they tend to um, or, or industry people um, tend to focus a lot on the on the yeast so <laughs> So it yeah. adds another dimension to the enjoyment. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for very interesting uh, conversation. I mean, I, I learned quite a lot about yeast and uh, it's, I think for listeners as well, it will be very, very interesting to, to understand the role of the yeast in sake brewing and uh, pay more attention at what yeast was used and uh, probably it's some kind of thinking drinking sake i think oh yeah probably they use special yeast to to achieve it which is yeah it's it's very interesting and uh, fascinating um so if people want to know more about you wh- where can they find you um well the, the the best place is probably my website which is uh, www.originsake.com um so that that's mm-hmm. my, my main website and from there you can link to social media and what have you but um, but that's where the main blog goes up um so so yeah if you're interested in finding out more then please check it out thanks a lot for that it was a great talk with andrew i should invite him again to find out more about a kurabita's life how a sake brewery works and other things about his life in japan i will put a link to andrew's blog origin sake in the show notes uh, we'll link his article about sake yeast, which has a lot of details about various yeasts used in sake brewing. That's it for today. I'll be back with more episodes. In the meantime, try to find sake made with different yeasts and compare. Although I have to admit it's not easy, as this is not the information usually put on the sake bottle labels. If you have any questions or suggestions, please drop me a line. My email address is alex at sugidama.co.uk or you can find me on Instagram at Instagram underscore blog or Twitter at Sugidama blog in one word. Look at my website sugidama.co.uk. I've got a constantly updated tasting notes section and a lot of recommendations about sake. The sake Andrew recommended is available at London Sake website and you can get a 10% discount just by entering SUGIDAMA, all in caps, at the checkout. Or try any other online sake store, pop into a wine shop stocking sake, or visit a Japanese supermarket and pick up something nice. Again, if you like the episode and want more, hit the subscribe button. If you would like to give me your support, please spare some time and leave a review at Apple Podcasts, or share this episode with your friend, relatives, and anyone who might ask you about sake. Post it on your social media, chat apps, anywhere. Thanks a lot for listening. Kampai!